I've been lucky. Yeah, three decades and you haven't. That is really lucky. <laughs> that is, that's pretty good. Can we zoom in on this um, grenadier and see if he has any hitchhikers on its dorsal fin? Um, if sure. you are looking for previous dive from past years, I believe you can look on our website and past expeditions, um, and they should have some links to prior um, things that we've done in other years. Um, we've got another question for Jennifer and Amanda. Well, we've got, oh, let's see. Erica and Amanda here. Oh, okay. Right, thanks for the zoom. I don't see any hitchhikers on that guy. Mm -mm. He looks Sometimes pretty clean. It looks pretty clean. Sometimes the copepods are hanging off of its door. Sorry, we're getting a tug there. Okay. All right, That's coming good. right. Whoa. Ooh. Well, hello, fish. Um, would a seamount upwelling displace kelp marine snow from this site? I'm not sure if I entirely understand that would question. Would upwelling displace the marine snow? Is that the gist of the question? I, I think so. Um, we said uh, an upwelling would increase more nutrients and therefore would increase some marine snow. So upwelling, that hap upwelling affects the water at the ocean surface. So the deep water... Oh, are they asking, does the seamount cause upwelling? Yeah, does the seamount. Yes, yeah, so we were having right. a discussion before about um, how the currents change around the seamount yes. and that there was an upwelling so um, and sort of brought more nutrients to that area. So I think it's a discussion of would it displace kelp marine snow. So I guess bits of kelp would be part of the marine snow. So we, yes. Hmm. It doesn't um, necessarily di displace the marine but there's lots of other know. ways for pieces of kelp to get to the ocean other than yes, up Yes, absolutely. So, and, and to get down this deep. But, uh, I mean, obviously we're this deep, and I don't know how deep the upwelled water comes from, but we've got plenty of marine snow down here, so presumably this water upwelling would also have plenty of marine snow. I think there are a lot of different ways to interpret that question. I think there are. Um, so I'm going to take the interpretation of um, can seamounts affect upwelling? And in that case, um, it's thought that current speeds increase. Dane, you done with that? Looking at your uh, telltales there? Yes. In the case of Davidson, it sits right in the middle of the California current. So as the California current comes up to David Seamount, it hits it. And it's thought that it projects <coughs> or deflects the nutrient-rich water up to the surface. Right. So that's why we might see, we do see a higher density of marine mammals at the seamount and around the seamount. Um, and so it's thought that the California current is bringing those nutrients up because the seamount is there. It's not a really upwelling uh, in the true sense. Um, but it just, it increases the density it of food in the water. Yeah, it deflects the California <coughs> current up into the water mm -hmm. surface because the seamount is there. And there's not a mound on the surface of the water above the seamount. So all the food that was in that volume of water that gets squeezed up over the top of the seamount is now more dense than it was before it was deflected up. Well done it. It's a maldanid worm, family maldanidae. I'm pretty sure that's what we were seeing. Took Maldanid. me forever to find the right family. Yeah, family maldanidae mm -hmm. uh, is the family that I believe that tiny, tiny worm that we looked at, gosh, like five to ten minutes ago, <laughs> was. Oh, an enemy down. Mm -hmm. Ah, that I don't know. This is a, these are, um, yeah, and these are these are near shore um, shallow species <coughs> subtitle. Yeah. What is the purpose of this pump sampling? Dane, you want to talk a little bit more sure. about that? Yeah, the, the purpose of the pump sampling is to collect water for analysis of persistent okay. organic Partial pollutants um, in the ocean. 
and persistent organic pollutants are those that break down mm -hmm. very very slowly and um, they have they have accumulated in the ocean and ocean sediments and we want to know what the concentrations are uh, in the deep ocean uh, we're trying to find the sources of very high concentrations of uh, PCBs that sometimes we measure in Monterey Bay and we have yet to really uh, find the smoking gun for those so we're wondering okay, if they're coming, coming up from the deep um, but the Go pump wide. sampling will um, collect a large volume of water. We'll pump a large volume of water over specialized sampling media that essentially extract those persistent organic pollutants out of the water and onto uh, fine resin beads that then, when the sampling is done, are taken to the laboratory and extracted with solvents, taking all the POPs off the resin and then um, dried down so it's a very um, thick and uh, concentrated um, sample of these contaminants and then they're measured with special machines so that we know what the concentration was in the ocean water that we collected. And uh, we do this because uh, the sanctuary is interested in uh, factors, uh, human caused factors that might be affecting the resources in the sanctuary and we know that um, the southern resident killer whales that do come into Monterey Bay to feed have uh, concentrations of PCBs in them that are probably causing deleterious effects to their endocrine systems and their uh, immunological systems so um, uh, this is a big concern um, and uh, the POPs have been listed as one of the impediments to recovery of that endangered southern resident um, killer whale population so we're, we're trying to get a handle on where these are coming from and hoping that we can uh, get some clues about that from what we see in the deep ocean. Very cool. That'll be interesting to learn more about. You'll have to let us know what you'll learn. Absolutely. That would be great. Mm, I have a question about Alvin. Were you guys talking about Alvin while I was at dinner? Uh, I don't know, but uh, um, Chad... Um, one of the science folks here on board from the sanctuary. Yeah, he uh, had a chance to go yeah. down in Alvin this yep. year. Here at Davidson Seamount. Very cool. That is an awesome honor. Um, our question asks if Alvin um, sank years ago. I don't, I don't know. Um, they kind of redo Alvin every once in a while and upgrade um, all of the parts and pressure abilities and electronics so i don't know if it has sunk at any point but um it's up and running yeah i don't i don't remember hearing about it ever sinking i don't no, know i have any failures yep. of alvin Thanks. all right quiz time because i say my numbers wrong um what is the deepest our rov can go 4,000 meters. 4,000 meters. Yep. Excellent. So that is what Hercules is um, rated for. Rated. Thank yep. you. That was the word I was looking for. Argus, Atalanta, and Little Herc are all 6,000 meter rated. Wow. Ooh, that's going to be fun. All right. So our surveys don't go year round. Um, we usually have to kind of battle, uh, not battle, but handle uh, the changing of the winter weather where that storms and swells kind of pick up. So typically we go from a April, May standpoint or start point um, to about now. This is our last dive of the season. Um, what we do in the meantime 
is plan and prep for the next year. It takes a lot of people and a lot of planning um, to make these trips happen and to get everybody out here and to make sure we've got food, um, make sure we've got everything that we need and we know where we're going and what we might be looking for and what we might collect. So there's a lot of planning that goes into that. So our winter months are spent planning, they're spent meeting, um, they're spent talking to each other and figuring out what's going on. Um, and then once the end of the spring comes, we start our adventures. So at the end of the season, do the crew and the ROV pilots and everybody that's long term, do they go home for a break or do they stay on the ship? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't think they stay on the ship because the ship does go to dry dock. Um, so they it doesn't seem like home. a great Miles, place. you should Miles know the answer to that. Yeah. What was the question? <laughs> at the what end of the season, yeah. do you go home for a break or do you stay on the ship? Um... All of all of science and operations go home um, over project season. Um, there will be sort of some OET staff that sort of comes and goes at our home port, but also uh, to Ensenada to dry dock. Um, there is a skeletal crew, uh, ship's crew that sort of maintains a winter watch. What um, is that? And where's your home port? What is that dark San thing? San Pedro, that's LA. Oh, that's LA. in the view now. Of the lasers. What do you see, Amanda? The dark thing drifting, and it's now on the left-hand side of the screen. Oh, the <coughs> benthicodon? Is it? Saw one before, and it seemed to be one of those little red jellies because of how it moved. But this one does not appear to be moving that way. I'm zooming in. Oh, now it moved like a jelly. Now, oh, there it is. Totally is. Hi, cute oh, little oh. butt. It's not red. No, oh, it's that's red. That's a different jelly. No, it's not. It is red. It, isn't How'd it purple? Get closer. Hold on. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, it doesn't look red to me. Uh, it's really far away. Come here, jelly. We must determine what color you are. Premature zoom okay. image. Yeah. Hold on, wait. Okay, I'm standing by. Closer. Coming wide. Full wide. It's a good demonstration of the light attenuation of red. That's true. Yeah. Okay, you ready? Oh, it's yeah, at you. it's getting redder. Yeah, there it is. Oh, it's uh -huh. oh look thing. at that. Okay. That is like magic. But that's good. That's Thank good to guys. know. So then when you do see those things at a distance, you can oh. say, hey, that has the morphology that's of the right. code on. Mm -hmm. It's not wow. always about color. Yeah, well, that was a good, fun. Though. These are one of my favorite jellies. Bear yeah, absolutely. I like these just guys. Spectacular. Uh, I think he's too close now. He's out of the light. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, you proved me wrong. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> now we work together to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So jellies and octopus he's all in the current seem to swim with the yeah. 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 okay, coming a frog wide. kick. That's the current fine. is a pretty Thank good you. current flowing down the hill, as you can see. Yeah, you we covered some distance. <laughs> no. Thank you. That was a rapid jelly. It was. Mm. So jellies can swim, but since they can't overcome the currents around them, they're considered plankton. Mm -hmm. Anything that can't overcome the flow of the water around it is considered a plankter. That's the so definition of plankton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh. I learned drifters. something today. Versus swimmers. Or those would be called another one. one. So like if you're in a swiftly moving river miles, you might become a plankton. Plankton. Even if I'm in a canoe. Mm. Then you'd uh. be let's see, what was what's that called when <laughs> they're you'd in the you'd be soaring. air surface interface? Pluston? Do you do you have a paddle Pluston. with you? Pluston. Sorry? I said do you have a paddle with you? <laughs> that's true. If you, you, if you don't have a paddle, you're at the mercy of the current. That's right. Hey. Oh, that's one of the few. Ooh. There's a fish. Ooh. So what do we think it is? <gasps> that is a oh my cuskiel. Gosh. That is a cuskiel. It's a giant cuskiel. It's a giant cuskiel. Yes. Erica, you taught us so much. So big. <laughs> Spectrunculus <laughs> grandis. Uh, I like to call grand. him spunky. <laughs> spunky. It's got a modified pelvic fin, those long He's fin rays coming down underneath no. its chin. 
So if that's 10 centimeter lasers, mm. how long do you think that fish oh is? Oh my goodness. Oh. Meter? Yeah. Perhaps. Yes. Big fish. Mm -hmm. That's right, yep. Just want to hug it. <laughs> uh, I want to touch it. No. I do. We are such different people. <laughs> no. You want to <laughs> hug a sponge, I'll hug a fish. I've done that. It's really painful. You end up with spicules in your hands. It's oh. like handling fiberglass. Oh, no. No, no, It's not no. a good reward. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want I that. I, I'm going to stick with the fish. <laughs> Do these guys have any uh, bioluminescence or counter illumination? Not that I know of. Mm -mm. Too hot? I don't know if they need Better? counter illumination because they're mostly you want wide? benthic oh. or benthopelagic. That makes sense. But for mating, oh, I don't even know. Oh, <laughs> well, hello there. The meeting of the minds. There, that's a great shot. Ooh, yes. Ooh, sea cucumber and under All right, thanks for the zoom. Beautiful. Just cruising. Do you know what they eat, Erica? Well, I think they might use those fin, bottom fins mm -hmm. to um, stir up the mud, uh -huh. s I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. So they might eat things that are in the sediment mm -hmm. or close to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love the color of that sea cucumber. I'm guessing. Yep, okay. Or they might use this. I think he's feelers. looking for a parking spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, now they look different when they're both in view at the same time. Oh, good. But boy, I struggled to tell these two. Yeah, now I part. Why, why did you guys wait so long to hang out together? Yeah. Now we got it. The Grindir has that pointy dorsal fin, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cuscula, I think maybe a continuous dorsal fin all the way to its caudal fin. So cool. It's a pretty cucumber. Yeah, it is. Um, so we had some questions as to how long can the Nautilus stay out and why not just go to the Southern Hemisphere instead of taking a long winter break? Well, occasionally we do have to work on the ship and make sure it's ship shape and ready to go. So we do dry dock it um, from time to time to make sure everything is good. Uh, how long can it stay out? I'm not sure. How long can the Nautilus stay out? I guess until we run out of fuel. Uh, we have an endurance of about 40 days. So that's fuel, water, and food stores. All right. So about 40 days. And I think we're, we're pushing pretty close to that right now. Mm -hmm. I think the last time we took on fuel was Honolulu. We took on some food in San Francisco the first time, and we didn't take on anything in Richmond. Wow. Well, I appreciate the presence of fresh produce. Yep. I was out once on a six-week cruise, and at the beginning we had this lush salad bar with peaches and um, all different kinds of greens, and then over time the greens shifted to iceberg lettuce, and the peaches were replaced by firmer fruits like apples, and the bananas turned into brown bananas, turned into banana bread. And by the end, the salad bar was pickles and <laughs> olives Cabbage. and sort of the, you know, preserved kind of mixes. Yep. Our, uh, our current fruit supply is pretty much apples and uh, grapefruits and oranges now. So all the mangoes good, are gone? Long-term storage, yeah, mangoes have been gone. Well, no, we had mangoes in the fruit salad the last that few months. That was mornings. nice, yeah. It was very nice. Maybe that was the last mangoes. Yeah. I do think it's interesting, that evolution of the food over time. Yep. Now, what's the adaptive significance to that evolution? <laughs> It keeps it us alive, us right? It, it does keep <laughs> us alive. I would say it gets some people not to want to stay out at sea for a long time. Uh -huh. I was still having fun. There's another one of those, the two anemones stuck together. 
yeah. or maybe they're both just holding on to the same tenaciously thing. to the maybe same so. rock. You want to zoom? Sure. Okay, zoom in. And then into that dark purple thing afterwards. Yeah, I want yeah, to see the purple oh, thing. It's a double headed. Um, hello? Yeah, that's a different Whoa, thing. They just look like they're the stuck world? to each other. So these are related to the mushroom soft coral. Is it crazy and to say they kind of look like that octo coral from before, but like way bigger? Oh, yeah, they and that is also related to the mushroom soft coral. Ha <laughs> ha. So as we were learning yesterday is that they, each of those two are individuals on a one base, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yep. So maybe this is the beginning of them. Oh, <laughs> yeah, together. yeah. Mm -hmm. Asexual reproduction. Maybe Ooh, so. How cool. cool. Cutting or, or something. Mm. Or just zoid formation. Is it strobilation? No, it's not no. strobilation. Yeah. Oh boy, I'll try to find that paper that describes mushroom coral growth again. And then uh, up above the lasers, if you zoom out again, there was something large and dark purple. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, up that. there. Mm -hmm. For why? My guess is it's a jelly on the seafloor. Jelly fall. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Yeah. Okay, zooming in. Yeah. Kind of like the oh. one we saw the other night. Yeah, it is. Taking a snooze. Pretty. Mm -hmm. Is it Peralia? Let's see. Hmm. It is also red. <coughs> Peralia is red? I don't know. Oh. I I'm just looking like it, it up. I like these deep reds that we can see down here in the ocean. Well, they're deep red because it turns black in the absence of light. Yeah, it's so this might be Peralia. adaption. Peralia rufescens is my guess. Okay. Okay. It's related to the... Um, Tiburonia Gran Rojo, which is a, looks like a big basketball size jelly. Yeah. Wow. That's big. <coughs> That's my guess. I agree Coralia. with that guess. Coralia. What do jellyfish eat? That it depends on the species, but anything that they can catch. So some jellies don't have very strong stinging uh, cells or strong stingers. So like the moon jelly. Aurelia uh, labiata or Aurelia arita, those have fairly lightweight stinging batteries of cells. So they're more eating tiny things that get ensnared, uh, kind of almost suspension feeding in a way and capturing small particles or marine snow. Copepods. Um, yeah, small plankton, zooplankton like copepods. But then um, beefier jellies or jellies with beefier, longer tentacles and oral arms often are accompanied by much stronger batteries of stinging cells. And some of those even have venoms. So like the um, Chrysora fusescens, what is that one called? The sea nettle, the golden sea nettle, or the purple striped jelly uh, are more catching small fish. Also zooplankton, uh, really things that get stuck against their tentacles that can't get away because they're too ensnared by those stinging cells. Gotcha. I have made many a frenemy with sea nettles and gill nuts. Oof. They are fun, but burny. And what's the, is it the box anemone or box, box jelly? jelly? Box yeah, jelly. Yeah, in Australia. That yeah. is very deadly. Yes. Yeah, Chironix fleckeri in Australia and then Irukandji. I don't know that one. It's Chironex something. But yeah, those box jellies have very potent venoms in them. So if those sting prey, uh, they can cause disruptions to the mm, to the nervous system. Was it the peripheral nervous system? Um, or the central? Mm, but I want to say it's central because it's so damaging. Um, but what it may do is sort of overwhelm the peripheral to the point of non-functioning and just We're sending in, uh, you into zero, seizures. Three, and those are found in tropical waters, not in this area. Right. Yeah, yes. they're uh, Australia and warm. 
warm waters over there. Um, is the jellyfish dead? The one we just saw, I'm going to go with yes. It definitely wasn't moving. So that one probably is not doing too well. That's not usually a behavior you see is just hanging out. Um, there's some interest in joining us out here at Nautilus Live, and we would love to have new explorers. Um, you can actually check out on our main page um, if you want to join us. Uh, we have a number of different internships and fellowships that are still open and will remain open until the very beginning of January, I believe. So if you are interested in becoming, becoming an explorer, um, hanging out on Nautilus with us, please go check those out. Um, I'm not going to lie, this job is a lot of fun. <laughs> we really enjoy what we're doing. Um, we've had some fantastic discussions about how being able to explore has sort of changed our perception of things and changed our way of, of viewing the world. So we would love to have more people uh, join in that journey with us and share your expertise with ours. And on that note, I guess I should update everyone on Nautilus Live. So if you are just tuning in, we are still traveling. Um, I think across a contour line, so a change in elevation down Davidson Seamount. Uh, this is an area that has never before been explored, so we're not entirely sure what we're going to see. So you guys are joining us in that adventure of what comes next. We don't know. Uh, so we're enjoying finding a number of different invertebrates so far. And if you guys do have any questions about anything we see, anything we talk about, or um, anything marine career-wise, just let us know on nautiluslive.org, and we'll try to get to all of your questions. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate um, you guys being here, and it's fantastic to share this exploration with you. I am on video. What are the transparent creatures that keep going by in the water? I think I've seen a few different ones. Amanda, do you want to speak to that? Which one? I'm not really mm. sure. <sighs> well, there's a lots of marine snow, right? Uh-huh. Sometimes transparent things are larvation houses that are sinking to the seafloor. Um, I haven't seen intact larvation houses in Herc's view, but I have seen a few in Argus's view. So those would look like big um, clear balloons with little brown flecks on them as marine snow's gotten caught on the outside. Uh, you might also see uh, some crustaceans that have fairly transparent bodies. So those could be the transparent organisms or particles that you're seeing. Um, and then, yeah, it could be jellies or the Feodarians, which I haven't seen in a while, but we saw near the beginning of our watch. And what are those? Feodarians are protists. Okay. That, ooh, what's that? Sorry. What's that on the seafloor? Can we take a look at that? Squishy, I think it's a chunk of fish. Fun. A chunk, chunk of, of fish? fish? Yeah. A what? I think it's drift junk. That's possible too. <laughs> you are right again. But <laughs> what so kind impulsive. Of, but what kind of junk? Uh, it's oh, a it's chunk of fish. What? Oh, it's a... Wait. Oh, it looks it like... It might be a cucumber. Um, no, no, I thought it was like chewed up kelp. Oh. But it's black. I think... I thought it was the vertical face of a rock. Oh. Well. Uh, it's got oh. some worms on it, so yeah, the rock face might be the best option. Fairly hard. Somebody <laughs> poke it? Somebody right. poke it? <laughs> That's okay. That's... A poke of We sign? may never That's know. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the zoom. Awesome. Um, so you guys I had can see while we're zoomed before they zoom out. Uh, those yes. tubes hanging over to the side um, in the sediment, they look like brown arches. So those are worm tubes. And um, so I can't see worms. It's a piece of wood. Out of yeah. No, I like see. Wood. I think I see bone, like the bone structure at the top. I see, I see wood. I think it's wood. Oh, it's I think is it wood? wood. It could be wood. Oh, it's probably been burrowed by shipworms. Yes, and that's why I it's bet it's wood. I definitely it go with like wood because I don't see any sort of like those hexagonal bone structures that would come mm -hmm. from um, 
Yeah. A mammal. Yeah. And I think a fish would be skinnier. Look at how attracted everybody is to that one little yep. piece of hard surface. Well, it's oh, hard. Gets hard so excited substrate. about it. Yep. <laughs> but it is carbon. I don't know if they can digest it, though. True. No, but well. it's a place to build their homes. And they can start, and someone else can finish, right? Yep. There we go. So it might take a few layers of creatures to break down this piece of wood. I wonder what the Thank story is of this piece of wood, where it started on. as a tree and how it ended up at the bottom of the ocean. It is cool looking. Okay, thank okay. you for that. Okay, mm -hmm. something like. Look for shipwrecks nearby. Um, I think if we had any shipwrecks, they might show up on our sonar. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep an eye out, but I don't think we're going to run into any of those. We just never know. Um, let's see, I'm getting a bunch of career questions. Um, so what are the job requirements slash expectations for our explorer and fellowship positions? There are a number of them. And I do not know the answer to all of that, but if you check them out on our website, depending on which one you are interested in, there are lots of different um, expectations, requirements, or um, explanations of what those jobs would do and how you can kind of fit into them. Um, some require more technical things, um, some don't. Um, would you allow an artist to join? Absolutely. We have had artists in the past. They're usually, I believe, science communication fellows like myself. And what they do is show the wonderful um, sense of the ocean and this exploration through their art. Um, so they've actually come out and done a number of pieces out here while exploring. Um, so we absolutely would love to have artists. We think it's a great way to um, interpret our exploration and share that with people in a wider field. Is it feasible to move into a job in marine research without a PhD? We have honors qualifications in Australia, but not globally recognized. Um, no, it's not. It depends on what you do. Um, so a PhD can be helpful in certain areas, but it is not necessarily always a requirement. Um, I don't have a PhD. I have a master's, and I absolutely love what I do. Um, but if I wanted to go further into being maybe a university professor or something like that, it would probably be best if I had a PhD. Um, so it really depends on what sort of interests um, you're driving to get at. Yeah, I would say that not every research project is um, run by all PhDs. Most researchers have people who assist them, who maybe do the field work, who work in the lab with them. So there are a number of ways that uh, you can get into marine research. I would say that a master's would be be probably pretty essential, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily a PhD. Yeah, and it's it's a lot about the experience too. So if you intern and, and spend some time in different labs, um, you can build up that knowledge from there. Absolutely, so. yep. Yeah, I started out uh, in a deep sea marine biology lab um, with just a bachelor's degree. Um, I was working towards my master's in geospatial intelligence at the same time, but uh, you know, you can get into it uh, with just a master or with just a bachelor's. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. Is that a big shrimp? Master's helps. It does look like a big shrimp. Yeah. What is the wiggly thing? Do you think that's the it? shrimp is that, that Mary might want? Is that a sea cucumber uh, swimming? Uh, I'm not sure yeah. what the white fish is. But is it? Would it take a long time to slurp the shrimp up? 
It's oh. not it's not required, but it would be nice. What's that? Slurp it, the shrimp. Would it take a long time slurp to slurp the shrimp? Ah, uh, we'd never get him. He's on the move. Okay, never mind. Not that important. They're really hard to catch. You Is get that near a them and they bolt. That's okay. a sinker. Uh, Thank you. Um, thank you, Al, yeah, for tuning in. Good, she is another one of our science right. communication fellows. We love to have you watching. Um, <laughs> how far apart are the lasers? Our lasers are 10 centimeters apart, or about four inches. So that's that. a big shrimp. Yeah, it's a big shrimp. It is a big shrimp. Well, we're getting good imagery. This is nice for our mm -hmm. at-home scientists. Here you go. Look at him go. So many different. Mm -hmm. Giddy up. And you can see oh. the way that it's swimming with those limbs. Oh, so yeah. those limbs are called uh, the pleopods. Mm. And uh, you can see that this one had ruffles, or frills on all those pleopods. Okay, those coming are called wide. CD, and they're adding, um, basically acting kind of like fins, <laughs> surface right. area, to help it swim through the water. Isn't there a constellation called the Thank you. Pleiopods? Oh, no, it's the Pleiades. <laughs> Talking about. That would be a good name for a rock band. Pleiades? The Pleiopods. Pleiopods. <laughs> You're offline. She's she knows. Got it. Uh, let's see what else we got. When the invertebrates are in view, can you also tell the approximate size? Well, that's what we've got our yep, lasers for. Exactly so we're just talking right. about that. Our lasers are 10 centimeters apart, so they really help us figure out uh, the size and the. So and that measure. white thing was a cuskiel. That one we no, just passed was by might have been a zoarcid. A zoarcid. Pout. It might have been. Okay. It went by pretty fast. Okay. Uh oh. It's pretty large though. Come back, fish. We need to identify you. Um, we have 48 people on the ship right now. That includes all of our scientists, engineers, and our boat crew. The information on the website is correct. That is currently who is on staff. So you can learn a little bit more about us from our bios and our information online, um, as well as more about the expedition, uh, past members, past trips, and there are some awesome videos. Okay, zoom in. Ooh, Ooh. Look at the egg cases. Well, no. Is that what that those is? Those are egg. Oh, well, no. I think they're is that a squirt? No, those are egg cases. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. A snail. Yeah. No, We're no. I mean the big fat thing. Ooh, oh, it does look like a tunicate. I think that's part of that sea cucumber. That's yeah, I think it is. I, I think, think it's it the is. Body yeah. of a sea cucumber. Yeah, those are egg cases. Mm. And look at the the cucumber up above there. I mean, it's yeah. so. There's a lot on this rock. This is this is the value of hard substrate in these habitats. It's like... Little oasis Yeah, in the little desert. oasis. Who laid those eggs? Yeah, where is it? Right. like gastropod egg cases. Yep, yep. So we should be looking for a snail somewhere. Mm. Snail. I don't see one. Maybe it's hiding under that sea cucumber. Could be. Boy, that sea cucumber just ballooned up. Maybe he, maybe he ate the whelk. Mm. Sounds like a Not lot. Not scientifically work. likely, but yeah. Good thing to think about. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Coming thanks wide. for the zoom. Thank yep, you. Yep. Yep. Very nice. Thanks. Nice. Mm. 
real quick. I'm going to check out this white guy. Looks like an anemone. Huh. Okay, coming white. Full white. Ooh, someone is requesting to slurp the eggs. <laughs> really? Yeah. Do you have a plan with what to do with these bulk eggs, internet human? Would this be an area that you would sink a boat to build up habitat? <laughs> oh, like so I'll answer that. This is Erica from the sanctuary. So um, it is not in our interest to sink any wrecks in the sanctuary as artificial reefs. Um, we have a regulation not to disturb the seafloor, not to discharge anything. And, and what is thought that if you sink a hard structure in a, har a soft sediment like this, you're actually changing the ecosystem. You might be creating a hard bottom habitat, but it's not the natural habitat. And if we add enough of these artificial reefs or shipwrecks, they could act as stepping stones from one area to the other. So it sort of alters the natural habitat. And sometimes artificial reefs are put down to create habitat in an otherwise depauperate um, area. Um, just because we're not seeing anything here except a few things on the sea surface of the floor doesn't mean it's depauperate or unhealthy. This to us is maybe a healthy habitat. We don't need to add anything else. So um, we have not added any artificial reefs in our sanctuary. Mm. Mm. Gotcha. That's super interesting. And I think I agree with that. I mean, you don't know. We haven't classified all the bacterial communities going on down here. And you start to mess with your bacterial mats, you never know the extent that it could impact your habitat. So I think mm -hmm. that's a great, a great point. So is that amazing sunset showing up on the quad cam? Yes. yes. Okay. It's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. We got a black coral and... Yeah, what is that other thing? Down there. I think it's another black coral. Yeah, I think so. The current is just sh uh, shrinking a little bit, the arms. Wow. See all the individual polyps. Oh, there are those yep. sweepers that Amanda pointed oh. out earlier on the base. There are some sweeper tentacles to ward off predators from climbing up its stock. That's interesting. We see that in the bamboo coral mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Neat. That's great, Amanda. Thanks for pointing that yeah. out. Okay, well. I'm going to tell Jim about it. Yes. That's Jim Berry, guys. He's been uh, looking at the deep corals at Sir Ridge, and that includes Isidella mm -hmm. tentaculum, which has the sweeper tentacles as well. And I, being a sponge person, was only familiar with Isidella as having those sweeper tentacles. So this was a neat surprise to see it yes. Um, Would this area be considered abyssal plain terrain? I think here, this would be considered maybe the skirt around the Davidson Seamount or the apron. I think if we went out a little further, it would be the abyssal plain. Gotcha. Amanda? Yeah. The abyssal plain is generally defined as about 4,000 meters and just super flat. Th this looks flat, but we're actually on a fairly steep ridge. Um, so it's sedimented, but we're still seeing things like corals, um, which are more suspension feeders that need the lots of currents that go across ridges. You can see some small going in. suspension feeders on the abyssal plain, but you probably wouldn't see the types of Whoa. corals that you can see. Look how long those tentacles are. Yep. Yeah. And we're just a little over 3,000 meters here. 3,184 3, <laughs> 3, meters deep. My brain can't keep keeps forgetting what the name of this is, but I know it starts Bol B -O -L. Bol Bolo Sarah. Bolo Sarah. Is this sea anemone? A super long. Yeah. That sounds Italian. 
That's a bola sera. Yes. See? Yes. <laughs> yes. Bona sera. For those looking in the science cam right then, it was a pure Italian way she did it, even with the hand <laughs> moving to it. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I felt it. I felt it. Okay, let's see. And urchins. And squat lobster. Hanging out under those tentacles. And a sea star. Trying to see mm -hmm. its mouth area. Whoop. Go to buy the lobster. He's running for duck and cover. Yeah. He gets we're a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me think of um, like a clownfish in tropical mm -hmm. reefs hiding oh. in the anemones. I wonder if this guy sees this as defense or protection. So does this one have the same sort of abilities to sting? I know I've asked you that already, and I've totally forgot. Uh, it does. All cnidarians have the stinging cells. It That's does. the thing that unites cnidarians. That's a feodarian between the lasers right Where? now. Where? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I said the wrong word. Xenophyophore. Right? Xenophyophore. Oh. Oh. Got me oh. outside. I haven't seen that False yet. False alarm. Wow. Okay. That's the first one we've seen today, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're different here. They're not the dark brown... <laughs> And so for the folks who weren't with us yesterday, tell us about those, Amanda. Oh, xenophyophores are very cool. They are single-celled protists, but they're some of the world's largest single-celled organisms. And they make these big masses uh, that's mostly the skeleton, which in these guys is called a test. And the name xenophyophore gives us a hint of how they build that skeleton. So xeno means... Xenophyophore means bearer of strange bodies. So yeah, Xeno is strange. Uh, for. Or others. Mm. For others. <laughs> or, or others' bodies. Yeah. Bearer so of others' bodies. Yeah. yeah. So um, Xenophyophores gather up sediments and bits of diatom, test, and other pieces of fragments of shells and cement them together to create their own test. And get this, they're single cells, but they have how many nuclei? Lots. <laughs> 20, so, yeah. did you say? Lots, Lots of them. They have many, many nuclei all housed within one common cell membrane. And, um, and so there's protoplasm moving around amidst all of those nuclei. So even though it's a single-celled organism, it has more than one nucleus with lots of, therefore, DNA, which can be transcribed um, to RNA and translated into proteins so that they can grow into these large sizes. What do they know about reproduction in xenophyophores? That's a good question that I don't know the answer okay. to. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you start a new one? Would you divide, would each of the nuclei divide and then migrate or would you start with 10 nuclei in each new organism and that's those pretty mind-boggling well what those you, all sound like ideas <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um Range? yeah let, let me get back to you I'm looking it up okay Oh, well, Amanda is checking that out for us. I've had a few questions of where are we located right now um, and if we're all in the same room. So, yes, we are all currently in what we call the control van. Um, we are set up with sort of headsets and microphones so we can talk to each other as well as talk to you. Um, so we're all working in a similar space. Uh, it's dark and there are a lot of computers. And lots of screens. It's very impressive. I am not a technology competent person, but there is a lot going on in here, and it is a fantastically set up system. Um, there are about nine of us in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, there are about nine of us in the room. Uh, we would still love more bandwidth, but we'll go with it. Um, and we're all facing basically one direction. All yeah. the screens are on. Certain you walls. can see inside the van right now on the there you go. quad feed. Let me you take a look take on the my iris quad down a bit. feed. You that. can see where we are, and that is us inside the control van right now. Um, as to where we are located on the Earth, we are off of Southern California. 
Or and Central California. I'm Central sorry. Central California. Central California. Please. Mm -hmm. Ooh, my bad. <laughs> Guys, I'm from the East Coast of Mississippi. Um, my California Full geography wide. needs some work. I'll go work on it. Um, Central California, and we are exploring David's Seamount, which is part of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. No, no one's asleep on the thing. Sorry. We're all awake. <laughs> there are <Hi>. scientists <laughs> waving. I'm just reading about xenophyophore reproduction. There we <laughs> go. And so we are currently exploring an area that has never been explored before. So this is fantastic, and we are super glad you guys are joining us. You have also been keeping, keeping up the questions and comments, and it's been great. We've talked about so many different things. Grenadier coming into view. Mm -hmm. That's fish. Here it comes. Do, 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 How do, does the depth do. affect your ears? Well, we're not actually super way down there. We send our robots down. Um, I don't think we could go down that far unless we had a submersible, and that would take us a very long time. Um, so we send the robots down for us, so we don't have to deal with any of that pressure on our ears. Well, why? Oh, I had a good question before and I missed it. Um, so while Amanda is still looking up our Xenophyta fours, um, Aaron, are you still back there? No. No. Oh. Okay. Um, Aaron or Erica? Erica, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Erica's here. I apologize. I'm reading and trying to talk at the same time, and we know how well that works. Um, Erica, if you could tell us a little bit more about artificial reefs. I've had a few questions as to what they are, and are they always ships? They are not always ships. So it's typically an artificial reef can be any kind of structure put down to try and repopulate an area with other things or with um, hard bottom um, loving animals. So an artificial reef could be a cement block, it could be a car, it could be tires, it could be a shipwreck, and anything in between. Um, and I think the question earlier was, would we ever put a shipwreck or an artificial reef down here? And um, that would change the natural habitat. So we tend not to do that in the sanctuary because we want to keep it as a natural environment. Um, and here we have a soft bottom community. If we put something hard down, um, hard bottom organisms would move in and maybe the soft bottom community would change and that's not really something we want to we want to do was that the question yep I think that answered it it was sort of a general of what is an artificial reef so it's some sort of structure that um, was it naturally there that we put down yeah. Um, we absolutely have those in Mississippi. We actually have a program called Rigs to Reef, Reefs, um, because they will build um, oil, rig, oil rigs um, offshore, and they used to break them down completely. But while they had been there um, using the oil rigs, it had grown a beautiful um, ocean community. And so when they break it down, um, they actually strip away a large habitat. So what they've started to do is actually, um, when they're done using those oil rigs, just sort of cut off the top of them and leave the bottom to be an artificial reef, which has flourished very well in that setting and has encouraged a lot of our sports fish to be there. So that's been helping out um, our fishing industry. Guys, what I found out about xenophyophore reproduction is that it hasn't really been studied. Okay. Uh -oh. Hopefully, they're so fragile, they're very difficult to take up intact, and so they haven't been able to be cultured or observed, even kept in aquaria to be monitored to see how, wow. how they actually reproduce wow. or what a small new xenophyophore looks like. And Since yeah, I they're mean, foraminifera, yep. it's thought that they can swap between asexual and sexual reproduction, mm -hmm. but how that happens. Okay. Oh. Oh. 
Well, so, and are they normally found at great depths like this? They are, yes. Okay. They're often found in deep water. Mm. So, hey, people who have been watching our dives, mm -hmm. if you are really excited about xenophyophores, it sounds like there's a lot that's open to be studied about them that so far isn't known. Yeah, we need some new scientists to study that. All right. Uh, why do we control call it the control van? Uh, it is our main center of control for the ROVs. So we are controlling our video. We are controlling our ROVs. We are, I think, controlling our live stream out of here. Um, and so what you guys are seeing and what you guys are hearing. And so we call it the control van because we are controlling everything. Except for the ship. Oh, good point. And... We're so. not controlling the ship, right. but we can call the bridge and well, ask them to do we're controlling the ship. <laughs> <laughs> we may not be physically typing in we the numbers, not, but we're telling them to. We're, yes. we're telling them where to go, absolutely. Yep. Yep. We're not, we don't, we don't have the, the helm right here, but we're, we're telling them. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who is in charge of regulating uh, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary? Can you repeat the question? Who is in charge of regulating the Monterey Bay Sanctuary? So the sanctuary program um, is under NOAA, the National Oceanic, Administra Ash National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And under that is the National Ocean Service. And so we fall under that, the National Ocean Service. And each sanctuary has a superintendent. So they manage the day-to-day -day activities, but we are all managed under NOAA and NOS, the National Ocean Service. But within that, there are state agencies that regulate water quality in, in ocean waters off the coast of California. So, and, and when permits are written to allow, say, a municipality to discharge treated wastewater to the ocean, so wide. Um, the sanctuary, those, oh. those permits are given by state agencies, okay. but the sanctuary um, has an agreement with the state in which they can comment on and um, request changes to those permits. Gotcha. And there are other, actually, federal agencies that control, say, dredging activities. That would be the Corps of Engineers. Um, but really, the objective and goal of the sanctuary is to keep the sanctuary as natural as possible. It's a good thing to preserve those areas. They're very important. We've got a few more questions on artificial reefs. Um, would trees make a good artificial wreck or natural? They're kind of natural, so I don't know if we would consider them artificial. Um, uh, a whale fall is not, I wouldn't call that an artificial reef. It's sort of a, a large influx of nutrients to the bottom of the ocean. Um, but that's not going to be a reef. We have not seen a shark yet. We're still looking. Trust me, my fingers are crossed. I would absolutely love to see a deep sea shark. Need help with a homework question? All right, I'm ready to help you. Um, list three facts about Danny Bailey's career. Hey, that's me. Um, yes, so my bio... Uh, might have been a little late in being uploaded, um, but I am here to tell you about my career. So I absolutely love sharks, and that is how I got started. Um, I went to school up in Rhode Island to be a marine biologist, and I did a number of different internships. At that point, I realized, hey, this is a job I can actually do. This is something that I can do with my life, and this sounds amazing. It really feels like summer camp. Um, work doesn't feel like work, even when it gets tough. So I said, great, I'm going to keep doing that. 
as we talked about before, I found out it was a great idea to get my master's degree. So I was able to get my master's degree and continue working on shark research. So I received a master's degree in shark science, well, shark physiology.